Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Thompson and I'm the Executive Chair of the Arts and Humanities Research Council. I'm delighted to welcome you to this second Boundless Creativity event following our launch in May. Things have changed significantly since then as the country moves cautiously out of lockdown and the UK's arts, cultural and creative sector continues to tackle the challenges that lie ahead. The week began with some positive and much welcome news with Oliver Dowden's announcement of the one and a half billion pound emergency rescue package. There are still many questions to answer though. What's the best way to reopen theatres and concert halls and to return to live performance? How can digital and immersive technologies help to build new audiences and to diversify them? And more fundamentally, why have so many of us turned to culture during this crisis? And why has culture proved so important for our lives as well as our livelihoods. This is where research in the arts and humanities can play a central role. There are several things that we at the Arts and Humanities Research Council are exploring, such as understanding the real time, differentiated and disrupted impact of COVID-19 across the UK's cultural and creative sectors, and analyzing how the cultural world has embraced digital technologies to overcome the twin challenges of telling global stories to global audiences while delivering the intimacy and authenticity of culture beamed into our homes. We've got a fantastic amount to get through. You'll hear an update on research commissioned during and in response to the pandemic, along with interventions from top cultural figures, Lem Sisse, Nicola Benedetti, Lu Zhang, and the secretary of the Smithsonian Museum's Lonnie Bunch and ending with a roundtable discussion involving some of the UK's cultural leaders. Shortly, we'll be welcoming the Science Minister, Amanda Soloway, and the newly instated Commissioner for Cultural Recovery and Renewal, Neil Mendoza. Neil and I have a special announcement today. We're launching a joint research project between the Department of Culture, Media and Sport and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. The project, co-chaired by Neil and myself, will be guided by an expert advisory panel to be announced later in the month. The aim is to enhance our understanding of the impact of the pandemic on culture and creativity, to look at the role of digital innovation in the cultural sector's recovery and renewal. You'll be getting tasters in the next hour of some of the hot off the press findings that are already beginning to emerge from the rich pickings of boundless creativity research activity. There'll be two opportunities for the media to ask questions that I'll chair. First, in our discussion with the Science Minister and Neil Mendoza, and second, in the roundtable panel. If journalists could please use the Vimeo Q&A function to submit questions, and please make sure to include your name and outlet. And now, I'd like to introduce the first of our ambassador videos from Nicola Benedetti. So when I consider my impressions of this period of time where as musicians we have been stripped of the ability to get together, to play for our audiences live, I actually have a huge amount of positive takeaways from this period of time and in particular one that is key to the Boundless Creativity campaign to communicate with, to allow participation of and appreciation of music and the arts regardless of boundaries. This pandemic has actually forced out of us a new relationship to digital. So speaking about the challenges faced by the culture sector during recovery um, and also what opportunities they present, I think any level of hardship and a stripping of ease or of privilege, of course, makes us all value everything around us with an intensity that we couldn't manufacture before. Well, thanks very much to Nicola. And I'm delighted that we also have with us today the new CEO of UK Research and Innovation, Professor Ottilie Laser who's made the time in her first fortnight in office to talk to us about why boundless creativity is important 
not only from the perspective of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, but from UK innovation more broadly. Welcome, Ottiline. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to join this round table, at least uh, briefly at the start, and to say something about, about creativity. So UKRI is, is a um, research and innovation organization, obviously, and creativity is therefore absolutely core to everything that we do. And I think that the, the, um, the birth of UKRI two years ago as a result of, the, of Paul Nurse's vision to bring together all the disciplines into a single organization um, absolutely captures the, the value and the synergies that we can create through cross-disciplinary um, creativity, bringing together all that expertise to um, look at questions in a different way. And I think that's been brilliantly illustrated by the way that UKRI has been able to respond to the pandemic a whole new set of challenges and problems to address. And the fact that we've all been together under one virtual roof, at least, has allowed us to bring all kinds of different perspectives together to bear on this, this problem. And uh, a lot of the issues flagged by COVID have been issues, as um, Andrew said, about our lives and our cultures. And the arts and humanities have, and research in those disciplines have been absolutely crucial in allowing us to, to address those disciplines. And the AHRC has mobilized in an incredibly impressive way to tackle those uh, issues really quickly and in collaboration with particularly the technology industry. And I think that um, that collaboration is, is absolutely epitomizes the power of UKRI, but also the, um, the way that COVID has both created challenges and difficulties, but also um, catalyzed um, solutions and opportunities um, going forward. Um, so the possibility through the Boundless Creativity Project to make access to these really important um, cultural and cohesive experiences that bring us all together, to make that in some sense way more inclusive whilst at the same time working productively in a situation where we're all kept apart. I, I think it's been just a, a visionary and impressive um, approach. And I think uh, it is a touchstone really for how we should think about the issues going forward. It was very exciting last week with the publication of the government's research and development roadmap to see that kind of thinking reflected more broadly. How can we learn the lessons from the pandemic and um, capture the benefits of the kinds of responses we've been able to mobilize to build back better uh, and to create a truly inclusive knowledge economy? And I think the creative industries have a crucial role to play in that uh, um, ambition through um, uh, their extraordinary ability to generate prosperity um, through uh, improving uh, productivity and their ability to address key issues in, in the context of our health and well-being and, and to build a more sustainable future. And the UK is very much a world leader in, in creative content and these partnerships between the arts and humanities research and the industry more generally, but the technology industry in particular, as highlighted um, very eloquently in Peter Bazalgette's 2017 review of the creative industry, really highlighted the opportunities that we had. And uh, those have been um, very much at the heart of the Creative Industries Clusters Programme, which is led by the AHRC at UKRI and funded through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, a, a UKRI um, uh, a uh, fund that precisely allows us to capture these extraordinary cross-disciplinary opportunities to um, uh, build this inclusive knowledge economy that um, will help uh, address some of the inequalities that we see across the UK. So um, this, the um, Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund that has allowed us to fund the Creative Industry Clusters Programme um, not only um, convenes world-class researchers and businesses, but it spans right across the UK, across the regions, and reflects 
that this mission very much um, the leveling up agenda of the government to try to use uh, R&D as a way to fuel uh, innovative businesses right across the UK and, and build this more inclusive economy. And uh, it's very exciting, as Andrew mentioned, that HRC and DCMS will collaborate to inform thinking about how we learn all of these wonderful lessons um, that um, have emerged from the crisis and use that to inform how the um, UK cultural institutions and creative businesses can come out of lockdown um, and uh, as strong as possible. So I think um, today is a great opportunity to reflect on all of these issues and to think about how we can um, retain the good things, uh, reset after this major shock to the system and reimagine how our um, uh, we can use all these extraordinary newfound ways of working um, to, to build back better. And um, above all, it's really clear that around the world, we will desperately need the extraordinary positive um, and engaging uh, input of the arts and humanities and research into the arts and humanities as a, a mainstay of our creative and innovative culture to sustain us through this difficulty to build a, a, a brighter and better future. So I really hope that you enjoy today's events in that spirit. And um, I'd like to thank Andrew again very much for the opportunity to be able to um, participate at the beginning of this event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arteline, and thank you for those opening remarks. I mean, it was helpful to be reminded of the importance of our cultural and creative industries to a, a knowledge economy, but also of the potential of digital technology to promote diversity and inclusion and to contribute to the work of addressing the social inequalities that I think the pandemic has exposed. And part of resetting to recover will be ensuring that those um, inequalities are, are not entrenched by uh, what we've been experiencing over recent months. Now it's my great pleasure to turn to our science minister, Amanda Soloway, and to welcome her. Uh, Amanda was with us previously for the launch of Boundless Creativity. She then spoke very poignantly of the importance of our cultural lives during lockdown, uh, both in reference to our well-being, but our personal mental health. Great, Amanda, that you can be with us again. I know this link between culture and mental health is something that you're interested in, and uh, we've turned to culture for education and entertainment uh, during lockdown, but I think it's fair to say we've turned to it for comfort and consolation as well. And I wonder, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts about, you know, based on our experiences during lockdown, about the relationship between cultural com consumption and and sort of learning to live with some of the anxiety, loneliness, isolation that lockdown has imposed. Mm, thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Gosh, um, broad subject. How, how long have I got? It said 10 minutes. I, I could do with 10 hours on this <laughs> subject. And Andrew, thank you. An absolute pleasure to, to be here as always. Um, I, I was just reflecting actually on, on your, your question. And, and I guess, um, as you know, I always try and sort of relate things personally on, uh, on, on these kind of questions. And um, one of the things, um, I, I, my dad lives in Wales and I haven't been to see him and they've obviously had a five mile um, limit in terms of where they're driving, although obviously that's been released this week. But also my auntie just um, lives up the road and has gone into, went into self-isolation. And, and I have to say, you know, that um, the reason why she's managed to get through this and the reason why, why my dad has, has got through this is all, all the things that you're talking about, actually. And I think we need to um, actually acknowledge how um, all, all these cultural things that you're talking about impact positively on people's lives. And um, one of the great things that we can do is, you know, you'll see phrases, we'll see there's, there's um, lo lots of things culturally on offer. And all of them have a positive impact on how we not only just um, get through this, but how we come out the other side as well. So, yeah, absolutely significant. I mean, I know, Amanda, that you're also a, a, a firm believer in sort of uh, bringing our cultural and creative industries, you know, into the, the bigger story about how the government uh, uh, can work to uh, promote sort of uh, economic growth and productivity and to do that in a way that sort of touches all of the regions and, you know, mm. sort of geographical reach. Um, 
What, why do you think it's so important that the, uh, the cultural and creative industries are, are fully integrated in the government's wider thinking about sort of industrial strategy and sort of, you know, rebooting the economy? Well, it, it, it seems impossible that it shouldn't be, in actual fact. I don't even think we should really be asking, asking that question or have to, um, because it seems very logical to me that if we're going to come out of um, economically, um, equipped, socially, mentally, all, all of this, then we have to we have to level up throughout the whole of the, the country and you, you'll have seen you know we've got a place strategy coming coming through but it, it does um yeah it, it is it is um it, it is so important isn't it that we embrace different cultures that we embrace embrace different um it, it's weird to think that i live in in derby I, I'm, I'm not different i don't think to people who live it live in the south but often we we must make sure that we do embrace all all cultures throughout the whole of mm -hmm. whole of the country. So now, absolutely, really, really important. Yes, well, as you know, I, I live in Nottingham, and uh, yes, where's that football? This is probably a conversation we shouldn't get into. <laughs> people in Nottingham think they're quite different to the people in Derby, and vice versa. But um, uh, yeah, you, if you stay with us, Amanda, we're going to bring yes. in Neil Mendoza, and uh, yes, it's a great pleasure to. Welcome my Oxford colleague and the DCMS uh, Commissioner for Cultural Recovery and Renewal. Uh, amongst many other things, Neil is the author of a very fine independent review of museums of England that was published in 2017. Mm -hmm. It's really appropriate, Neil, that you're with us today in your new role and congratulations on that. I just wanted to start off by asking you how you think this joint research review that I've just announced will help us understand what's been happening to our sort of cultural life and creative sort of um, industries during the pandemic. And, and, and how is it going to help you as the cultural commissioner think through what's required for cultural recovery, renewal and growth? Got it. OK. Um, isn't that Andrew? First of all, I think it's, it's quite a bit, it's a bit of background noise coming from somebody. It might be Amanda, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this uh, partnership project, really, between DCMS and AHRC, and I'm, I really hope it will add a major contribution to uh, DCMS's work and deepen government's understanding of, of the sector. But before I start, I really want to mention again the cultural package that we launched this week that you brought up in the beginning. You've seen that it's a giant £1.57 billion recovery package for the culture and heritage sector, and it's a plan that we've been working on at DCMS for months working very closely with colleagues and in, in, uh, in officials in Downing Street and the Treasury. And in, in a way, I'm not sure that we've all grasped just what a major moment this is for culture, because the scale of this intervention is unprecedented in the UK and actually internationally, whatever the other numbers being banded around are. And it, it really represents um, a huge endorsement yeah. by the government of the cultural sector. And they've recognised it, not just for the intrinsic worth of culture, for its own sake, which we all understand, but as others have mentioned, but for the important part it plays in our economic and community life. And I think it's a really big deal, actually. And this fund will enable us, enable us to protect cultural assets of regional, national, international importance, and including, crucially, um, the levelling up agenda that's already been mentioned a couple of times. But even with the government support on this scale, the sector is going to need to learn to survive, particularly as we come out of the out of the pandemic, um, probably with new business models, new ways of working, and of course, new ways of connecting to audiences. So it's really my hope that this project will help us learn more about how the cultural sector is interacted with digital technologies during the pandemic and give us a blueprint for how they could embrace digital skills and technologies more widely as part of their restart yeah i mean i think as you say it you know it's um this this intervention will go down as a, an important chapter in the history of the cultural and creative industries and it, it's a very significant and much needed lifeline but i think as both you and the secretary of state have already made, made clear while it's a necessary intervention neil it, it's perhaps not a sufficient one and i just wondered in your role i mean just thinking about the whole issue of sort of live and lockdown yeah uh, and how we get people back into venues. What sort of things do you think that um, you would like to know that we don't know enough of at the moment through this research review? What's the knowledge that we don't have that if we had it, you know, it would really help you in your role in advising government about sort of the uh, 
you know, the, the re so-called resetting to recover of the sector? Well, I think we need to know as much about the experiences of cultural organisations, both in the UK and actually around the world. Mm. Um, an enormous amount has happened. We've seen here, you know, fantastic work by um, the National Theatre on YouTube. I thought the old Vic's staging of lungs was brilliant because it wasn't only just a, it was cleverly thought through as, um, as, as a stream, but also the way that they priced it and broadcast it was really clever. Um, there are wonderful commercial aggregators of cultural content, virtual tours of museums, robot tours. Um, so we need to know, we need to learn uh, from this lockdown experience what works and what hasn't worked, which experiences are satisfying and which aren't, and then also which cultural projects can be monetized commercially. I mean that's that's going to be quite important. We know that you can put you can put stuff up for free, but it doesn't necessarily help. And the point is that now it's it is so. Um, urgent because we are going the cultural sector is going through such a difficult period and you're right this giant fund won't be able to save or rescue everyone it just won't um and moreover we're really concerned about when performing arts can actually restart when's that going to happen so we've got a great practical urgency to learn what we can whether it's you know i can go on and on distance opera in spain or theater in south korea and i'm hoping that we can use this project um, to gather data, bring together research from the medical arena, from behavioral science, from digital work, to work out how to ensure we can have a strong recovery in, in, in the sector. Thank you. I mean, I think it's very powerful, actually, to see both of you on the screen, because actually, you know, to have our science minister, you know, representing our sort of knowledge economy and our cultural commissioner thinking about, you know, a key part of that knowledge economy, I think speaks to the, the joined upness of government here. We probably have only got time now for one or two questions, but I'm wondering whether um, any questions have come in for me to... Um, there's one from Craig Simpton, who's the arts correspondent at The Telegraph. Um, and maybe we take this one, is how the research project's going to work and can you expand on and advise the measures that may be required to restore public confidence to cultural participation? Let me just give you a couple and then I'll, I'll give you, each of you the floor once. Um, how do we get audiences back? Uh, what might these new business models look like that get people beyond the idea that online is free? Um, there's a lot there. Let me just give you each an opportunity to say one final thing and then we'll move on. So, uh, Amanda, could we come back to you first? Um, yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot there, Andrew. And like ever, I always want more time and apologies that I can't stay longer as well. Um, lo lots of things. Ottoline uh, mentioned the roadmap and that's one of the key things really is that we're really focused, not just on what it is we need to do, but actually doing what it is that we need to do. And I think that is the biggest message that I can say to anybody is it has to be all about action. And you're right, you know, we need to get people going back into these places convinced that they can go 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 safely um, and there are lots of lessons learned I think I, I agree with you but just before I, I, I quietly disappear you know it is incredible when you think that the three of us are on this screen to, together we're talking about this we're having a debate about this and I hope I think there will be lessons learned in terms of productivity as you mentioned um, but but for me this, the single biggest thing is we need to do this considered but we need to make sure that we do it with a lot of action and thought because we do absolutely have to get the economy moving, but particularly, as you would expect me to say, the uh, creative arts as well. Thank you, Amanda. And Neil, Thank back you. to you for one final comment. Yeah, the only thing, I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've just monetized something myself. I've just, I, I, you know, I'm going to do an ad. I've just signed up for Marquee TV, which is a sort of a Netflix style aggregator of cultural content. And I think that's, you know, that's a clever way of, 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 of potentially monetizing and, and um, and helping the sector, we'll see it. We'll see if it works. It looks pretty impressive from 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 where I where I sit. Well, thanks to both of you, and uh, thanks for putting some wind in the more wind in the sail of boundless creativity. It's been great to have you both with us. Yeah, thanks again. So I'm going to move now to introduce our next video. This is very exciting. It's from one of the world's leading museum directors. I'm a very big fan of his. He's a powerful voice on the subject of the intersections between creativity, culture and diversity. Let's hear from Secretary Lonnie Bunch. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. 
It's my honor to take part in this boundless creativity event with the Arts and Humanities Research Council. The Smithsonian has had a productive relationship with AHRC as we've hosted some of your postdocs as Smithsonian Fellows since 2013. I think it's been a tremendous benefit for us both. Let me begin by saying that I know this is a difficult time for all of us. The dual pandemic of racism and deadly disease has taken a toll on our physical, emotional, and economic well-being. But now, as the world tries to navigate these challenges, I would argue that organizations promoting the arts and the humanities should take the lead. We can address the health crisis by equipping the public with knowledge, explaining the science, and disseminating best practices to keep our audiences and employees healthy. And we can address the crisis of racism by fighting fear and blame with hope, encouragement, education, and inspiration. In times of profound societal upheaval like we're undergoing in our respective nations, organizations like ours and those you support in the UK are vital. We help citizens remember our most deeply held values and we use collections, exhibits, and programs to remind us of our common humanity. This moment presents an opportunity to think creatively and to find new modes of engagement. That means enhancing our ability to provide digital offerings to ensure that we're reaching people wherever they are. That means working more collectively across disciplines to find new avenues of research. That means boldly addressing topics that are nuanced, difficult, and contentious. Embracing the inclusion and representation is crucial. The past few weeks have also reinforced the needs of all of our institutions, especially cultural ones, to commit themselves to being representative and inclusive. Too often, history has been told from a white male perspective. That must change. We need to meet the challenge of the moment and live up to the promise of justice by telling the unvarnished truth and confronting our past. One way the Smithsonian is doing that with the Museum of Die Built, this new digital platform talking about race, generating conversations about race with digital tools, instructional visual videos, and multimedia tasks. I believe that it's important for us now, if these protests are gonna justify, we wanna help the world understand what we're going through. But first we need to set an example. That means not only telling more diverse stories, but making a giant leap forward in the diversity of our researchers, our collections, our staff, and our boardrooms. It will mean better outcomes in the quality of what we do, and it will show other sectors the value of being truly invested in diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. I believe in the power of the arts and the humanities. In times of great sorrow, I have always looked to the beauty and meaning of culture to ground me, to offer me hope and solace. Although we're going through massive challenges, I believe cultural institutions can lead the way in finding solutions and making this moment truly transformative. I am confident we will do so. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for, Tony, for that rallying cry there about seeing history from diverse perspectives and, uh, and his powerful idea of a dual pandemic. It's my great pleasure now to introduce two more videos from our cultural uh, ambassadors for Boundless Creativity. So we're going to hear first from the Chinese actress Lu Zhang, and then from the poet and broadcaster, Lem Sise. Recently, we learned about the new initiative Boundless Creativity in the UK. And I think it is particularly important at this moment to have international cooperation on this topic. And if we can overcome the barriers that prevent people from enjoying different arts and culture through technology, this may bring new opportunities for us to understand the relationship between theater and the audience, and find out how arts and culture can improve people's mental health and well-being in special occasions. The cultural sector has always faced challenges and I think the largest challenge that we face, how do we show the value of what we do to the wider community? We have now got a much bigger publisher, and it is the internet, than has ever happened before, than any press could ever deliver. Which means that 
are rules as to what is good and art and what is not I've cha- are going to change more over the next 50 years than they ever have done before. Boundless creativity means that you can unlock all of the traps which people find inside their own mind and spirit. Boundless creativity means that creativity is not the monopoly of artists. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Edward Harcourt. I'm the Director of Research at AHRC. And of course, research lies at the heart of boundless creativity. You're now going to see four short clips from people working on research projects AHRC is currently funding on pressing issues presented by COVID-19, from digital innovation and the accessibility of arts and culture to the role of arts and culture in the resilience, mental health, and well-being of the nation. Though these are just a small snapshot of what we're doing, I hope they convey to you some of its breadth and significance. Roll the clips, please. I'm Professor Andrew Chitty, and I lead the Creative Industries Clusters Program and the Audience of the Future Challenge for UK Research and Innovation. Now, they are both multi-stranded, big efforts to uh, push forward the boundaries of applied research and development in the creative industries to create value for creative businesses through research. Um, audience of the future uh, is particularly concerned with immersive technologies and how they're applied in the future. Uh, creative Industries Clusters has a broader focus uh, and includes big university partnerships. So one of the things we're looking at in our Audience of the Future program is what are the experiences that we can build future audiences for. So say in the museums and gallery sector, how can we build audiences that aren't reliant on coming to the museum? Now, a year ago, that was obviously of interest to the sector, intellectually and and commercially, but now it's a kind of life and death proposition because not, even though museums and galleries may be opening again now, the visitors they'll attract will both be smaller in number for a long period of time, but also whole segments will be missing. Hi, I'm Eliza. I'm Head of Policy at the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, or the PEC. And in the wake of COVID-19, some of our newest research has been in partnership with the Intellectual Property Office and Audience Net, and has focused on understanding the impact of the pandemic on the demand for TV, film, games, music, and more. To do this, we surveyed a representative sample of over a thousand of the same people every week for six weeks to get a real time picture of how much the pandemic has changed our habits of cultural consumption. Hey, my name's Lorna Proven. I work at Ardman Animations as an exec producer on a project called What's Up With Alex, working with researchers at the universities of Nottingham, Loughborough and the LSE. Our research seeks to advance mental health literacy and provide early intervention for students aged 17 to 21 through a series of animated films and an online resource tackling topics around isolation, competitive society, social media, independence and perfectionism co-created with young people. At the heart of our research is the concept of co-creation. We're carrying out workshops um, now all online with a diverse mix of students to understand the key mental health challenges they face and seek their insight into how best support young people in recognising and addressing these issues. My name is Helen Chatterjee. I'm a professor of biology at University College London and the AHRC COVID grant that we're working on is looking at community and creative responses to the COVID lockdown and beyond. We're looking at the creative responses, so how people have been engaging creatively throughout lockdown and how the issue of being isolated throughout the pandemic, but all for other reasons, for physical or mental health reasons, means that people can't engage in the normal way that they would creatively, whether that's going to their local museum or library or reading group or visiting their local park, how they can engage creatively both online and offline. So the problem that culture, I think, experiences at the moment, in in this moment, this post-COVID moment, is 
it's built around institutions and institutional ways of delivering things that currently don't function. They're not functioning. That doesn't mean they've lost their purpose. It just means that the, the venue or building based idea of how we uh, assemble, create and distribute culture does not work at the, at the time. So that makes it really important to think about what are those distribution means that are required at the moment and how do we provide access we have to rethink that to ensure that we don't create new barriers to access in the process. So we don't want to replicate any barriers that access from historical methods uh, of, of delivering and distributing culture in these new methods. And that's why fundamentally a lot of the projects that we're doing in research, which are looking to adopt and, um, and, and uh, pull through innovation in digital technologies are absolutely vital at the moment. In fact, they've never been more vital because the whole system is disrupted and we've got to find our way to the future as well as restore the amazing kind of cultural institutions. Well, that wraps up the first part of this event. Um, we're now moving on to our virtual round table. And this is going to be chaired by the distinguished science journalist and board member of UK Research and Innovation, Vivian Parry. So Viv, over to you. Hello everyone, very good to be with you all. And you've heard from Amanda Soloway of the importance of recovery and reset and the critical role that arts and culture plays in that reset and recovery. And underneath that, of course, is the role of research. We've got a panel here uh, with me today who've, oh, virtually, of course, uh, to talk over some of the key elements of this. So can I introduce to you uh, Peter Florence, director of the Hay Festival, Jan Daly, arts editor of the FT, uh, David Olesunga, uh, historian and TV presenter, and welcome back, uh, Edward Harcourt, Director of Research Strategy and Innovation at the AHRC. I want to start with you, Peter, because you've actually had to do this incredible pivot. Hay Festival takes place at the end of May, and you found yourself in March with a incredibly short time to completely turn around what you did. How did it work and what was your experience? I think the adrenaline helped, actually. The do or die issue around creativity really fired up both the delivery team and also all the artists and the audiences who took part. It came at maximum exposure for us. We had bought all the stuff, we'd paid all the contractors and we were about to launch the programme when the festival had to be cancelled in March. And what we found was that there are amazing opportunities in completely rethinking a format. The essence of festivals is commonality, the common experience, and how you recreate that digitally is very surprising. Much of it is about the platform, being able to not only simply watch television and tweet, but having the audience participation and engagement live in the same platform. So that was a key part of it. The other great advantage is that you are no longer restricted to an audience who can fork out the money to find the time to and be geographically able to come all the way to mid Wales, find money to stay, find stuff to eat. So anecdotally, we know that the diversity of our audience multiplied many, many times. But also in demographics, we found that this was a combination of a very intimate experience, people talking directly to a laptop in somebody's home, but also an extraordinary global experience. And there's a, there's a map that I think we've got, which shows the spread of people who were taking part in our AHRC funded Wordsworth project. Now, some of this, and if you could show it on screen, it would be wonderful. Some of this is down to uh, Helen McCrory and Benedict Cumberbatch's pulling power. But if you look at that spread, that's not only across pretty much all the time zones on Earth, but there were people watching this program from 140 countries and taking part in it. This radically changes how you begin to understand what it is that you're producing. 
and it gives fantastic value to the accident of the English language as a global tool, but also it accepts the idea that everything you do has to be pitched for everyone, not simply for any kind of niche audience. Did you make it pay? We were extraordinarily lucky in that the two systems we had for earning, nobody except the mixed martial arts industry seems to make online events pay uh, in ticket price. But what we did have was a fantastic donation program and some very generous and, and inspired sponsorship from both the Welsh Government and Bailey Gifford, who have been traditional sponsors of the real live event, but also pivoted to digital, found the massively increased audiences very exciting. And just as the artists found creating work, whether it was painting or ballet or music, for this kind of deliberate face-to-face -face experience, everybody responded, I think, with boundless creativity. <laughs> And uh, actually, I read that uh, BTS, which is the biggest K-pop rock band in the uh, world, a pop band in the world, in case you're not familiar with them, they launched their new album, Bang Bang Con, online, and they managed to gross $18 million and reach 750,000 people, which is the equivalent of 50 stadium shows. So certainly they're able to uh, make the uh, digital pay. But Jan, this is a problem really that we're going to have to think of new business models because some art forms are simply not set up to go digital in quite the same way. Yes, absolutely. And it is a huge challenge. Um, I can't pretend to have much in the way of answers because I think that everybody is still learning about this. Um, several of our speakers this morning have talked about the importance of learning. And I think we are all learning. And it, this isn't, there are many, many bad things about this situation, but there are some very fascinating things about it. And one of them is the opportunity to study and indeed research the way in which audiences and performers actually do interact, which is probably a more complicated thing than we realized. Um, so we're learning, um, performance is certainly learning, audiences are also learning about perhaps different ways of, um, that they want to consume and participate. Peter's talked very eloquently about the advantages of having an online audience, which is very div much more diverse, um, much more accessible, or um, I mean, gives much greater accessibility. And I think we all need to learn very, very quickly from these changing habits. Whether there will ever be a form, an, an, an artistic, a change in artistic form and a change in business model that will fully satisfy the special magic that comes from being there when somebody does something, when somebody sings, when somebody acts, when somebody makes theatre. It's very difficult to say whether that will ever really happen. Um, but I, I imagine that the business models of the future will be something of a mixture, that we will have some version of live plus digital, which will, we, ideally, which will corral the best of both worlds. David Olasugo, I imagine that uh, you will have been in enormous difficulty with your making films because you know you have a production company and getting uh, you know traveling has become impossible. And we've had this huge increase in demand, but of course the supply has dwindled because people just haven't been able to get out and film. But uh, does this excite you that actually you'll be able to get potentially to a much wider audience uh, digitally? Well, I think like like everybody, I've been on a journey that began in March with despair and belief that this was um, a fatal change, uh, an event that many organisations wouldn't recover from, and I wouldn't want to minimise the issues. But there has been a quite incredible burst of creativity in all sorts of industries and, and a realization that technology that pre-existed that was there 
you know, Zoom was there long before the pandemic, that these technologies have capacities that we didn't understand and that audiences have appetites that we didn't understand. I think it's very difficult to imagine what the future is going to hold. It's very difficult to make predictions at this moment. But I think one thing we can safely say is that no one's going to go back to a world in which there are not these digital options. There are not these virtual versions of whether it's uh, uh, you know, literary festivals, or whether it's public uh, um, talks, whether it's theater. I think the the it's very often the case that technology's arrival, its emergence as a new technology, is not what brings it into our lives. It's the marrying of that emergence with an event, with some phenomena that changes our lives. And this moment of potential, the fact that this um, this year will mark a, a change in how we consume culture, how we interact with it, that was not something that was immediately obvious in March when we were all feeling extremely frightened at that moment. So it has been an incredible journey. Television is on a, on a journey of trying to make tele make television within these uh, these new and difficult and constrained times. And again, what you see is incredible creativity. You also see the new involvement of people um, who weren't getting to make programs. We are having to rely on local crews in local countries. That's having a really interesting effect on widening participation in the making of television. Talk about widening participation in the making of television, which is very important, but there is also a digital divide in terms of who can access high quality digital content. Uh, you know, our broadband isn't sufficient. And in many households, it's very difficult to have a private space or to have any, you know, it, uh, interaction that's not wrecked by your brother doing his gaming down, down in his bedroom. So do you think there will be a digital divide here? I think inevitably there will, and I think it's something we have to take on and, and, and confront. I think in terms of the access to broadband, that's something which I think Britain has got to take very seriously, and I think we're very much behind the curve on this. But I think in the ways that we live, the way our houses are operated, I think we're at the, we're at the beginning of a radical restructuring. If travelling is reduced... And I think it's going to be reduced not just because of the pandemic, but because the pandemic has revealed to us the advantages of making our lives less um, less geographically um, uh, atomized. I think that's going to change our relationship with our houses. Uh, it's going to change our relationship with where in cities we live, our relationship with cities and with transport. And again, as well as there being a divide, there's incredible opportunities. The idea that if the production of art can, does no longer need to be a purely urban phenomena, that places that have been considered to be cultural deserts, places where productions of you know television and other art forms hasn't taken place are suddenly viable, suddenly become places that it's easy to move through. It's going to be very interesting to see how television makes real its desire to reduce its dom the dominance of London. How we measure that is going to be different if, if companies don't have offices anymore, but also how we how we inspire that, how we energize that. If being in Soho is no longer a prerequisite for making television, then I think the gloves are off and the potential is enormous. And Edward, that really shows the possibilities for the uh, for arts and culture really being the linchpin of recovery, uh, particularly in those areas that have been uh, most blighted in, in the past. And how does research play a part in making sure that that recovery happens? Well, I think one way of thinking about the present moment is that UK society, and indeed the whole world, is in the middle of a gigantic live experiment about what it means for culture to go digital. So I think in 2018, DCMS published a document called Culture is Digital. That was rather an optimistic forward-looking title at the time, but if it wasn't digital at the end of 2018, it's a lot more digital now, thanks to the incredibly agile adaptations, um, some of which we've just heard about, that have taken place just over the last three or four months. But we're still just beginning to take the measure of what it means for culture to go digital. And of course, that is a research question. And uh, when I use the word live experiment, I don't use it lightly. We're gathering, you heard from Eliza Easton at Nesta in the earlier presentations, how we're gathering real-time data on changes in patterns of cultural consumption. We're also gathering real-time data on the ways in which access to culture buffers against the mental health ill effects of social isolation. So uh, but inevitably, because we're still in the middle of it, there's a great deal that we don't know. So this research remains ongoing. Um, the uh, other thing that is uh, 
very important, I think, about the role of research in relation to the question you posed is where the research happens. Because notwithstanding the point that David made, and I think it's a super important point, that if we're all online, you could be online, doesn't really matter where you're online. Universities have a, which is where a great deal of AHRC funded research takes place. And that of it that doesn't play, take place in universities takes place in big institutions which have large buildings and uh, as it were inescapable physical location. Universities have a very important role to play in the national economy as anchor institutions. So there's research that shows that of the two kinds of place which is most important for you to have in a city if your economy is to flourish, university is one and a large hospital is the other. So um, I think there are limits to the extent to which um, the place of research can become any old where, a place of your choosing, wherever your laptop or iPhone happens to be. And I think that's a, the interaction between the liberation from place and the inevitable location of these large research institutions is another of the very interesting research questions that we need to look at as we think about the role of arts and culture in regeneration. Jan, we were talking about how this whole process is democratizing access to the arts, no longer the preserve of the middle class and uh, affluent alone. But how will performances on the arts have to change with a global audience? And how will artists themselves have to change? I mean, doesn't filmed theatre become cinema? Ah, well, it's quite interesting. I have talked to quite a number of performers over this time about how they've had to change their techniques and manage their techniques um, when they are switching, when they're doing, you know, they're making the digital switch and they are performing in a, in a, in a medium that they hadn't necessarily originally um, envisaged or they, they're not so experienced in. Um, I'm not certain that we should really think though about um, having to make huge adjustments for a global audience because I think culture still has its power from its base. Um, we have to be very careful about globalizing culture, I think, because it can very easily become rather bland and rather kind of, you know, we must, you know, we must please everybody. Um, even though we can all listen to things and watch things and experience things from all around the world, I still think that um, creative people work best if they work from their base point, you know, from the ground from which they grow, and that that makes the most interesting experience. And that is why we want to watch things from around the world, because they are different, not because they are homogenized. I think most creators think like that. Um, whether the performers, I mean, performers have to be hugely adaptable, and in this situation, they are, they are proving hugely adaptable. I think that um, all kinds of things have happened. I mean, at the moment, um, at the at the FT, we're in the middle of commissioning a, an online play, which is going to be um, broadcast as part of our online festival in September. And already, I'm I'm reading what's coming in, and it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, the sheer range of creativity that this emergency, this this pandemic has unleashed is is very very interesting not all of it works but the best of it is going to be durable i think it's going to be something that that reaches beyond this moment well i think historians like david and indeed andrew thompson will look back at this period as having been a period of boundless uh, creativity and I may be a lowly scientist but actually i have enormous optimism about the future for arts and culture because they are absolutely critical and essential to our recovery from COVID-19. And on that, can I turn back to Andrew Thompson? 
Thank you, Vivian. I think we were going to allow just a few minutes to take questions. Um, I, so I will keep my eye on the chat box. Uh, we have uh, a question about the wider impact to society of reduced and changed